Welcome to Timeshare Talks for Consumers, and I'm your host tonight, John Raymond, along with Irene Parker and Wayne C. Robinson. A uh, little bit about myself. I'm a timeshare resale broker. I've been in the business for over 20 years, and I, uh, I own a lot of timeshares. I've helped a lot of people buy and sell timeshares, and um, um, it's just it's a, it's a good way to get into the timeshare ownership if you don't want to pay developer prices, which is a big savings. Mm -hmm. um, Irene Parker, a good friend of mine, uh, has helped a lot of people with uh, uh, selling their timeshares. Wayne C. Robinson is uh, the author of Everything About Timeshares, and it's an awesome book. You guys, any anybody that wants to buy or sell a timeshare, they should be reading this book first, and you're going to find the information right below in the description uh, where you can get his book on Amazon. It's a great book, and thank you for writing it, Wayne. Uh, the purpose of this show is um, to uh, educate and promote a viable secondary market for timeshares and to be a bridge between uh, timeshare developers timeshare owners and timeshare members. And we hope that uh, this information can be helpful and that you'll share it with all your friends. Uh, we have a, a guest tonight and uh, Irene Parker, I'd like you to introduce her. So uh, take it away. Thank you, John. Uh, Karen and I have become lifelong friends because of timeshare. And I just want to take a few minutes to talk about the events that led up to our interaction, and then I'll let Karen take it from there. Uh, it was a, quite a remarkable series of events. In March of 2019, I was asked to attend a, a Florida legislative workshop about proposed timeshare um, bill. And I sat neck behind who was then um, the senior VP of legal Wyndham, Mr. Jason Gamble. And I listened to him testify that people did not need lawyers or exit companies because Wyndham had a hardship department. And it was just a couple months later, someone contacted me and said they owned at Wyndham Carriage in Ontario. And I had not, I wasn't familiar with the resorts. I know a lot about Canadians that buy in the US but not a lot about Canadians that buy in Canada. Mm -hmm. So I emailed a, a volunteer who admins a Facebook in Canada, and she responded that she happened to own at that resort and said they do not allow foreclosure. And I thought, how can you not allow foreclosure? In the, in the US, if you do not pay your maintenance fees, um, rarely is there any implication to that. Um, but in Ontario, apparently, she said that if you could be in a coma and they, they would wait until you passed away and then they would go after your kids and grandkids for, um, for, for maintenance fees on fully paid for uh, timeshares. And one uh, granddaughter that contacted me, her father was in a nursing home and 100% of his income had to go to pay the nursing home and they would not allow a release. So I published an article about it in August of 2019. It's the first time I had 134 comments mm. and um, I, we published all of them and I learned about the Carriage Facebook and Karen reached out to me and said that there were going to be some annual meetings and they were kind enough to do a GoFundMe mm -hmm. to help, because I'm a volunteer, to pay our way to Canada so that we could attend the meetings. And it was the most remarkable experience I've ever had. Uh, the fact that the meeting had to be, the first meeting had to be canceled because the facility only held 300 people and over 1,000 showed up. So with that, Karen, I'd like you to take it from here and how they say how what can one person do well not a lot but when one person joins with a lot of other one persons you can move a mountain and that is what these volunteers did that led to both resorts ultimately being sold to full condos and will no longer be timeshare so karen let me know how let us know how you jumped into all of this fray Wow. Well, and, and, and as I was just mentioning earlier, it, it's, uh, 
in, in some respects, it just seems like yesterday. And in other respects, it seems like so long ago, so much has happened. I, I went back, you know, in my office, I, I, I had to open up my filing boxes and, and remind myself just of all the activities that have gone on over the last couple of years now. Um, that, that there were some uh, periods of time where things were moving very quickly and other periods of time that just it was dragging on and we wondered whether we would ever you know see the, the day that, that that we are in now um, so so you're right Irene let me let me back up if I can just sort of my own on-ramp to where we both came together um, so so you mentioned about uh, attending the the uh, the hearings in in I think you said March of, of 2019 I think you said um and and around about that same time so me and my little world in in just outside of toronto uh in ontario canada um you know i i i've owned i, I first bought in 2002 i bought from the developer so john i i, I you know you kind of <laughs> oh, uh, i paid full price i paid full price i got the free dinner weekend something something oh. on, and if you do then you go and it's a beautiful property Absolutely beautiful property. So I was I was sold. Uh, you know, they popped the champagne and everybody got excited. You know, the typical thing after being in the sales pitch for yeah five hours with my family because I couldn't decide. Um, but yeah, we bought in two thousand two and then and then we went uh, you know year over year. The the resort is actually only about an hour from my home, and I was a busy executive and I looked at it as though it was going to be like forced vacation with my family. So it was actually a good thing um, and and enjoyed the property immensely and actually bought more time like bought bought a second deed um, in 2010. So so John is, and, and Irene, as you were mentioning, you know, there's sort of the points programs, um, but in, in, in Ontario, what Carriage Hills and Carriage Ridge was, was deeded property. So when I bought in 2002, it was a fractional ownership. You actually got a, a, a deed registered with the Ontario Ministry. Uh, so it was a government uh, supported piece of, of, the, of the property. So I thought I was, you know, I don't know whether I, I owned the doorknob or a light bulb or something, but I, <laughs> I owned I owned a piece of something, and I owned an every other week access and so on. But but so and that was 2002, and then I bought again 2010. So you know, let's let's fast track to uh, March of 2019, just because I want to on ramp with Irene. Um, that by by March of 2019. Our maintenance fees had gone from you know 500 and change when I first bought to about 1300, 14, almost almost 1500 dollars, wow. uh, which is you know. And I was I was trying to I was thinking that's a lot of money, and I was I was uh, I retired, and I wanted I, I was ready to get rid of the timeshare. I thoroughly enjoyed it. The property was lovely. The people were super. The staff was fantastic. It really was a family experience. And I really enjoyed going there, but it had, it had served its time, and I wanted out. Um, so uh, at that point, yes, I knew Wyndham owned the property, and and it's funny, Irene, it's that that as you're hearing Jason Gamble say that, well, they you know they have their ovations program. Um, I, I, I I I googled a little bit and and found out about ovations, and um, I hadn't quite committed that I was going to you know get rid of my property or my ownership. But I contacted Wyndham and and uh, they had said, oh, yeah, they have their ovations program. And so around about that same time, about March, I, I stumbled across the Facebook group, the a very uh, small, um, I, I'm going to say maybe 100, 200 uh, members at the time. And and I uh, joined, you know, I had to answer questions that I was an owner. And I, and I, uh, I went on to the Facebook group and I saw a few people that were, Saying that they couldn't get out of their timeshare, they were trying. They were trying to sell it. There was no secondary market. They were angry because Wyndham, who owned about, um, I think, a little more than ten percent of the deeds, um, were were selling time. They were renting out their space through their own distribution channels. You could rent through Expedia or any one of these uh, travel distribution platforms for cheaper than our maintenance fees. So um, it, it just seemed unfair. And so why would anybody want to buy, you know, one of our, our, our property ownerships if they could just rent it for cheaper than our maintenance fees? So there was no on-site sales uh, office anymore. The, the secondary market had really dropped out. The buildings were starting to get a little ratty. Um, and and uh, so I went onto this Facebook group and there's lots of, of noise about people trying to sell it. 
And so me naively typed in my comment, well, what about ovations? Apparently Wyndham says you can use ovations. Like I just tattooed naive across my forehead. Um, and and uh, so I learned a lesson in that uh, those few days, like the yes, no. The ovations program is is not for lowly Canadians. We, we, we don't have access to that program. Because again, you have this deed. So you can't just, you know, walk away. It's like walking away from your own home that you have a deed in. The city comes after you. Even unpaid taxes, they will they will come after you. So um, so I thought, well, this is not this is not right. This is not right, and I I don't accept this answer. So um, the 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 problem that we had was in the contract that we signed, there was an what they called an obsolescence clause that said that if greater than 75% of the owners declared the, the, the program or the property obsolete, that it was no longer serving its purpose, then the board would be uh, forced to put the property up for sale. So uh, between March and I guess August, um, that we, we the Facebook group started to grow because at least we had some kind of some kind of off ramp, but it would have to be this obsolescence vote because if there was nobody to buy your deed, it was considered property. Even if you died, they had the the deed tied to your estate. They couldn't close the estate without having somebody accept the ownership of the of the deed. Um, and if if um, if there was monies owing, then the estate they could come in and you know carve out money from that to pay back. But the, the, somebody had to take over responsibility for this deed. So um, it 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 in and of itself there was enough people that that wanted to try and offload because as you can imagine, this is now 20 years after the original large group of people who bought their timeshare. So most people, if they bought it in their 40s, 50s, maybe 60s add 20 years and look at the age population now and you've got a significant chunk of people that are struggling medically struggling financially can't travel like they used to their family's not interested in doing the big family vacations anymore it's a significant proportion of people who may not have internet access anymore they're in nursing homes you know they're not getting the news there's just this this debt that's growing but there's nowhere to offload the debt there's no re no nobody there were there were there were hundreds of of uh of advertisements for people trying to sell it for a dollar, sell it for a dollar, nobody would buy it. And, and they could access the beautiful property by just going to Expedia and renting it for a day or a week. So um, so come August, the reason I say August is because in August, the board of directors had a, a big meet, like they had their meeting, their pre-AGM meeting. And there were a few owners, especially a couple from the Facebook group that attended that board meeting. Um, and they were asked to step outside while the board had an off-camera um, uh, discussion. And when they were invited into the meeting, news was was learned that the um, rate of delinquency, which was first thought to be about eight to ten percent, people who weren't paying their maintenance fees, lo and behold, there were some questions about the accounting, and something got cleaned up. And oh, don't you know, more than twenty percent of the owners had stopped paying their fees. The the um, the books were in were were, in, were a mess. Millions of dollars of of maintenance fees were were not paid. Had not been paid, and and so in keeping the books going, of course, the debt that hadn't been paid the year before, they were in the process of establishing what the maintenance fees were for next year, and they just added that into the maintenance fees of the people who were still continuing to pay. So as you can imagine. <laughs> There's a there's an escalating ramp of the maintenance fees, which made people very angry, um, and so August was really a um, um, uh, you know epiphany that okay this this has really gotten too far, and we knew that we didn't like a lot of the secrecy that was happen happening at the board, so we thought you know what we need to we need to overhaul the board, we need to get people on the board of directors to actually find out what's going on and be more transparent to the owners. Um, and so the plan was hatched that uh, in August that we would look to the October 2019 AGM and put nominate uh, some some uh, people onto the board who we thought would were listening to more of the owners. The big challenge was trying to find the owners because uh, in in Ontario in the privacy laws and so on there there was no mailing list of the owners. Um, so we asked the board for a copy of the mailing list and they said no. Uh, that the mailing list was a secret um, and uh, we said well then uh, you know how are we supposed to reach people and they said well 
you know, show up at the AGM and you can say what you want. And we didn't like that because we were trying to raise awareness. So the the theme here is raising awareness, raising awareness. Her Herculean efforts were made to raise awareness to all these sleepy um, uh, owners who didn't really know what was going on. So um, a few things started to happen. We really started to promote the Facebook group. Um, and we learned of a court case in Ontario where for the purposes of uh, supporting an AGM and and uh, business, the spreading of business about the properties, a judge in Ontario had said that a board of directors is not permitted to withhold uh, the mailing list if the news is for the purposes of discussing the business of the property. I couldn't get the mailing list and say, hey, I'm a shoe salesman and I want to sell you shoes, can I still, you know, can I get the mailing list? It has to be about business of the, of the property. Clearly that was the case. So we provided a copy of that court precedence to the board and to Wyndham's legal department and said, you know, you have to release this information, the, the courts support us. So they did. That was huge because it now gave us the opportunity to uh, get access to the people. So um, we did. And it was, again, the first pieces of information they gave us that it was all printed, uh, hard copy email addresses. Like you have to remember now there are 11,000 owners <laughs> uh, owning 17,000 intervals. So, um, uh, you know, when you get the hard copy paper uh, information of names, a good chunk of the information was missing. We said, this is not acceptable. You need to provide us uh, like a digital copy so we can work with this. Eventually they did. But there was lots of raising awareness and advocacy and, and uh, um, trying to get that information. Eventually we did. And uh, we were able to uh, start to um, e-blast out um, uh, information about uh, what was happening with the properties. And I think as the awareness was raised, that's where uh, Irene came in because you were then talking to, to some folks about the property and we heard about your timeshare wizardry and, and we thought it, was so, it would be so helpful to hear from what your experience was with timeshare owners wanting, like, was it reasonable to expect that we should be able to get out of our, our ownership? So with the raised awareness and, 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 and several of us, you know, Chantel and Cheryl and, 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 and uh, Lori and, and, and Bruce and Michael and, and Scott and like, and, you know, throwing names out there. It was like, it wasn't, it wasn't just me by any means, by any means. Uh, it was quite a, quite a group of us that uh, started to reach out to owners to encourage them to come to the AGM. The good news was it worked. The bad news was it worked. Uh, all, <laughs> all these people showed up. Normally, I think AGMs are, you know, a sleepy event of maybe 100, 150 people. And Irene is right that uh, here we were in October, uh, and and we had uh, well over a thousand people attending one of one of one of the events. So, knowing that uh, this was going to be a big deal, um, a few of us, um, you know, yes, we we set up a GoFundMe to, and everybody chipped you know money into the hat and. And we contacted Irene and 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 her and her lovely husband Don uh, uh, agreed to come to to fly in. It was cheaper to fly to Buffalo, so um, you know my home's about an hour and a half from from Buffalo. So I got in my car and drove to Buffalo and over the border and and picked them up. And we were able to bring you back into Canada and do a little sightseeing before we drove up to uh, to the property. And um, we scheduled several meet and greet events before the AGM. Um, to, you know, hear from a timeshare expert about, you know, were our concerns reasonable? Like, how do you deal with Wyndham? Like, it was quite the walks of life represented in that room. Um, and so, yes, the AGM was was uh, um, quite busy. We, we encouraged people because we had some people handpicked uh, to uh, put forward as candidates for, for nomination for the uh, board. And so there were all these proxy forms being filled out. And because the lineup was out of the building and all the way down the side of the building through the parking lot, and uh, we heard that they were start the board was starting the meeting inside. And of course, you're not allowed to do that. <laughs> if you have people, you know, owners and shareholders, you know, property holders. Um, so, so luckily there were enough people inside. And Irene and, and Don being, 
you know, the, the lovely couple from Florida, here they are the end of October in, in, in Ontario, it's freezing cold, pitch black. We got them pushed in the room, into the, into the room uh, sooner so they wouldn't freeze to death. Um, and uh, luckily the, the, the crowd uh, agreed that the meeting should not proceed with when you have hundreds of people still waiting to get in and wouldn't because fire code, it exceeded fire code allowances. So they agreed to uh, stop the meeting, and and that's exactly what happened. They stopped the meeting. They canceled it and said, "Well, given the number of people that that uh, want, have something to say, uh, we will reschedule the meeting." Which, in a way, was unfortunate because Irene then went back home, and the the AGM was rescheduled a full month later in uh, another venue. So, and I think Irene, you're on mute. So, um, so, so, yep. Go ahead. Okay, uh, we did too long. It. We did attend the carriage, uh, the other carriage meeting yes. this next day. Right. So, so, so there's two properties. There's Carriage Hills, about 172 units, I think, in Carriage Ridge, which is a little bit smaller than half that. Um, and and the Carriage Ridge one was able to go ahead. Um, so that was good. You could see, but um, the the we were not successful in getting our. Um, our candidates uh, notified to the board because it's a smaller, a very small. Um, 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 facility and or, um, ownership, very few owners uh, who had signed their proxies and, and had just basically left it with the incumbents to continue with the property. The much larger facility, the Carriage Hills property and the Carriage Hills owners, that AGM was postponed and it was rescheduled for a month later and, it, and they actually changed the venue and they, they sent it about an hour uh, north of that location to Casino Rama which uh, has an auditorium in there that has about uh, 10 times the capacity. And it was still pretty full. So again, people lined up to get in, but at least this time um, we, we, uh, we had our, our people placed. And, and actually it's funny because, you know, talking about advocacy, I, you know, we, we, uh, we did flyers, you know, to, to talk about uh, you know, li listing out the, um, the concerns that we had. And we had volunteers, you know, handing these flyers out um, in, in the lines so that people who were just showing up for the first time would get some information. You know, we had our little business cards uh, uh, printed up that had our Facebook group on it and we had a website. Um, and this is all like just volunteers trying to do their best to raise awareness of what was going on. So the AGM took place. Um, unfortunately, Wyndham used their 10% uh, ownership and, and at the last moment uh, introduced uh, one of their executives from Orlando uh, by proxy, like the the, um, the property manager um, had a, read a letter of, of a nominate, uh, nomination uh, from the floor, you know, as to speak. Um, and Wyndham put all of their votes against that uh, candidate. And despite the fact that I think about 80% of the people in the room voted for the candidates we tried to put forward, um, there, there were enough votes sent in by mail added to Wyndham's putting behind their candidate that our candidates were you know failed to get onto the board so that was that was very disappointing um but they we did get one concession they did say that look we we've hired uh, bdo to because they recognized that the, there was a problem when you have 20 percent people defaulting on their maintenance fees and they're seeing year over year over year the maintenance fees for everybody who is paying going up and up and up they knew there was a problem so they, they offered a solution to their benefit or to their credit, sorry, to their credit. Um, they, they said, look, we'll hire a strategic accounting firm, BDO. We'll work with um, a law firm as well, Thornton Grant and uh, TGF. Um, and we'll, we'll just sit tight. We'll work on something in the background. We'll come back to you. So this is November, 2019. Um, and we wait. And they say they're gonna they're going to share news in the first quarter of 2020. Well, think back. Gosh, what happened in the first quarter of 2020? Um, oh, a little thing called a pandemic. <laughs> um, and and so, but we waited. And so February of 2020, which before you know things really hit the fan, um, there there was a board meeting, and many of us went to the board meeting. And we asked, do you have an update from, from BDO? Like, what are you doing with the properties? And uh, we were told at the board meeting, because we knew that the, the day before the board meeting, they were having a meeting with BDO. The board was having a meeting with BDO. So we thought we would get an update. And they said, uh, no, it's too new. 
you know, the information that they've shared with us is new to, too new. We're not prepared to share it with you yet, but we promise that, you know, by, by the end of the first quarter, we will be able to provide you with an update. So on the very last day of March, which is the first quarter, they said, sorry, we can't update you because there's a pandemic, um, which a lot of people were, you know, four letters, Z-O-O-M, Zoom. You know, people are meeting. They can they can update us. So so we kept, kept getting put off and put off and put off. And then at the end of April, uh, I think around the 29th or 30th of April, poof, out of the blue, we get notice from the board and from BDO, who's now been assigned to be the official administrator. And by the way, the, the, all of this is main, this is going to jack up our maintenance fees <laughs> because all of this consulting fees and lawyers fees and so on um, have have uh, um, uh, been been cutting into the whatever maintenance fee revenue is being generated. But at the end of April, they announced they were going to court to uh, to um, bring BDO on as official administrator um, and uh, get a court blessing and have the court start to oversee what was happening with the property. Um, now the the so so anyway, any any questions up to this point? I, I, are you still? Uh -huh. with when when did the uh, survey take place? Okay, so so the the um, and 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 the survey. So I'll get to this because the, the survey was in July, I believe, um, of of 2020. So in May, so at the end of April, we get out of the blue surprise. There's an announcement. They're going to court to officially identify BDO as the administrator taking over you know, the, the running of the property. Now this isn't declaring it bankruptcy or bankrupt. This is just to, to, to provide a, sort of an official uh, uh, process by which BDO as administrator working at the direction of the courts will now oversee what do we do with this property? How do we solve the problem that we're in? Um, now what was concerning was the few of us that were um, really taking note and continued to press to try and figure out what was wrong. I'll call them the Facebook group um, and, and specifically, there were three of us who, a, along with what I, what I call Team Awesome. So there was the three amigos and Team Awesome. And, and the three amigos, myself, uh, Lori Smith, um, and, 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 and Bruce, um, were, were uh, working together with a team of about 10 others. And as soon as the court documents came out, we jumped in and started to read them. And there were provisions in there that were very disconcerting. And one of the key ones was that it had what I call the muzzle provisions. It would eliminate um, the AGMs. It would eliminate the owners having any say in what was going on. Everything that was was uh, empowered to the board to decide what would happen. And and so we said this is this is not acceptable. And it was clear that the law firm, who by the way in February got changed because it was a different law firm before February, and then they they hired a new law firm because apparently the old law firm. There was a conflict of interest. We don't know too much what that it was about, but it was clear that the the lawyers were representing the board. They weren't representing the owners because the owners are being cut out of the process. And so the few of us, the three amigos and and uh, um, uh, Team Awesome, decided we need our own legal counsel because we can't just like let the board decide everything. So we did a GoFundMe <laughs> just because the GoFundMe worked so great to bring. Irene up to see us. Uh, by this time, the Facebook group had had gone from about a hundred to about three thousand yep. um, wow. from the AGM and from additional um, uh, reaching out of what was going on. And so we passed the hat, and we got you know tens of thousands of dollars to afford to bring a lawyer on board to uh, to support uh, to support us. And so through the help with our lawyer. Lawyer Lou, Lou Brzezinski from Blaney McMurtry, thumbs up for him, God what a saint. And I promise you, he spent far more hours than the money that you know we had in our hands going, Lou, can you help us? Um, and, and he was able to negotiate for us, strike out those provisions of muzzling the owners. Um, they, the, the, the court papers were, were indicating that the actions moving forward were gonna focus on restructuring the resort. They were going to put all their energy into figuring out how to make the resort, you know, better and more affordable for all the people who loved their resort. 
The problem was there was a whole bunch of us that knew we don't want to have anything to do with the resort. So we're not interested in restructuring the resort. We want the resort sold. But are we the majority or are we the minority? Don't know. So uh, there were there were several steps that we got the court paperwork rewritten. And um, the first item on the list was to get a decent members list because it was clear from the members who came to the AGM, they didn't know anything that was going on. They didn't know they didn't know that the property was in in financial mess, um, and and they they had no idea there were people. They hadn't, they hadn't done any mail outs of anybody. So when we were contacting people using that members list from before, this is the first that people were hearing about anything. They were just getting their maintenance fees bills, writing a check and sending it in, or just ignoring it and not paying anything. So um, uh, through, through the help with, with Lou negotiating for us, we got the court papers rewritten so that the first order of business was they must create a complete members list that was complete in terms of if you're in a nursing home, then what's the address of the nursing home? I mean, there were so many that we called them the missing in action uh, owners. Um, so that was the first order of business. The second order of business was to conduct a survey. Don't restructure a resort nobody wants. So uh, the second item was to, to send out a survey to all of the owners who you identified from the members list and ask them, do they want to maintain their timeshare relationship? And if the answer is no, then um, you know don't restructure and so item c which was and build a restructuring program was only dependent on the outcome of the survey in in the in the second item so that had to go to court and get blessed uh which was great because up until that time they 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 were just focusing on restructuring and not asking the owners what the owners want so that was really pivotal so in July, the, the draft survey was presented to the court again for blessing, because all this is happening under the eye, watchful eyes of, of uh, um, Judge uh, uh, Barbara Conway, wonderful lady, great, great thoughts. The court system is working. Um, but of course, everything being done by Zoom, because we're in the middle of the pandemic through this whole time, remember? So um, through July and August and, and into September, we had, uh, we had the survey process um, and it was at the end of the survey process, it was identified that, um, yeah, as uh, Irene, as, as you and I bo both know, less than 13% of those who responded wanted to keep their timeshare. Everybody else wanted out. And at that time, we were even willing to pay to get out because the survey said, you know, you had to declare your interest to exit and, and pay this amount of money. And, and people were just so desperate. It's like, fine, we'll, we'll pay, we'll pay. Like just, we want out, we want out so badly. And there was no secondary market. There's no other way to get out. But because we had built it, sorry, I mean, go ahead. And I want to just interject here that I, I talked to so many people from carriage that paid money to exit companies. And one of the former sales agents at carriage had an exit company and many people lost money to that. Uh, Corey Stegman was the name. I wasn't going to give him the breath of my lungs to mention his name. Um, because What's his last name? Do you want me to mention his name? Sure. Last name. Stegman. Stegman. Um, so he he was one of the original guys who sold timeshares for the- I used to work with him in Mexico. I used yep. to work with him in Mexico. Oh. Yes, I know him. Wow, that's he what he's had, been doing. Because I work in multiple, Whistler. He had multiple companies, and he eventually his uh, multiple of those companies ended up going on the the Ministry of of uh, uh, Government and Consumer Services blacklist. Um, several. So, yeah, so he's Canadian. We no. wondered. We wondered whether or not. Um, he had access to the membership list because people were getting, you know, solicited by this timeshare exit company, several of these timeshare exit companies that, that all seemed to go back to him and family or there was a connection there. But yeah, people paid tons of money and he knew you. So, so I understand that there's some options where um, like foreclosure, I don't know about that, or, you know, you hand it back. If nobody's going to take the deed, you can stop paying all you want, but you still owe the money. And so these these companies, I know there was one in Collingwood about an hour away. And I know I was in, in Puerto Vallarta and, and, and uh, there was timeshare companies there. And Wayne, you, you probably know about this. 
better than me, where, where uh, com timeshare companies will say, buy our timeshare and we will take the timeshare off your hands that you have. I Vita, Vita, Vidanta. Vita Vidanta was the worst for saying, if you buy Vita Vidanta, uh, we'll, we'll get rid of your carriage. But then they would just send them to sell my timeshare now and they'd post an ad and it wouldn't sell. And, and, and you have two timeshares, but you don't want. Right. So, so, um, and, and you'd be caught up in the, you know, drinking tequila and like, oh, that sounds like a great idea. And, oh, you'll take my timeshare. Yay. You know, sign this paperwork. And, 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 and there was a rule back at Carriage Hills and Carriage Ridge on the board that uh, a corporation could not buy your timeshare. Mm. Mm. So if a timeshare company wanted to buy, even in, 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 yeah, in, in, good, in good intentions, the board of directors approved or rejected all sales. So they would reject sales that would come through from a company that would, would buy a, a timeshare, would buy, buy somebody's timeshare. So that was the other reason why a secondary market was no good because a, a company couldn't buy the timeshare. It had to go from a private person to a private person. So, um, so where was I? So, um, so yeah, the survey. So the survey came back that everybody wanted to, uh, to there wasn't enough people to keep it going. So um, that was was not an epiphany to many of us, <laughs> but was, <laughs> was an epiphany to the board and to BDO. Like, hey, I guess I guess we shouldn't restructure. <laughs> no sugar, Sherlock. <laughs> Don't bother. Um, so it was decided that yes, they would uh, put the property up for sale, and and they did. And uh, so this is 2020. And if you can remember, the similar Canada had had similar issues as the rest of the world. That the resort was actually closed for many months in 2020 because of the pandemic. Uh, they did a gentle opening with lots of um, uh, you know um, um, COVID. Uh, um, um, uh, protocols to to make sure that people vacationed there safely and and to the staff's credit you know they were just terrific in in allowing people to to use some of their time but so much of people's paid time wasn't accessible because the resort was closed um and of course nobody got their fees refunded um it was like oh well too bad um and uh but at the same time it's like you know like we're done. So we, we um, little, little highlights, you know, we had meetings with the, uh, or a meeting with the Ministry of Government and Consumer Services in uh, December of 2019 after the AGM debacle. We had been having some um, uh, email conversations with them for consumer protection purposes. And they actually attended the November AGM at the Casino Ramas Auditorium, so they could see firsthand just how um, big corporations can come in and own the board uh, and place people on the board that they want when they own 10%. They saw firsthand how large corporations, uh, even with deeded property, but who have access to these vacation rental platforms can undermine uh, individuals who want to rent out their little timeshare to somebody from the public to use the property. Well, you know, I can't put my property on Expedia, right? I, I just don't have that that corporate power, but but uh, the, the large companies do. So um, we thought there was a, a, a place for government advocates and government awareness to see because the, the Ontario government was also looking at um, um, reevaluating and um, updating their timeshare, their consumer law, the Consumer Products, uh, Consumer Protection Act, and there's a chapter in there on timeshare. So we thought they needed to see firsthand what was going on with the uh, one of one of Ontario's largest timeshare properties. Um, so the, the government, so we did advocacy with the government. We did advocacy um, with uh, the, the media, whether our own social media, getting a website and getting an email lists and sending out direct e-blasts. We also worked with, um, um, a very nice lady from uh, uh, who is a court reporter in Barrie. So she would um, get the court papers and report on the court papers. And because she was writing for the Barrie Times and the Midland 
Midland News and Aurelia Matters. It's a conglomerate uh, owned by the Toronto Star people. So uh, good readership of these little online village newspapers. She was sending uh, writing articles and that would, you know, pass the eyeballs of people who uh, would see their online news and contact us at the Facebook group to see what was happening and get registered with BDO to get updates and so on. So we did the social media, we did the, I'll call it print media, it was digital media, but not controlled by us. We did the government piece. Um, and then we had to hire a lawyer to that, because there were, I think half a dozen court, um, um, court events, court hearings uh, throughout the process and just make sure that our rights were being protected. Uh, because as you can imagine, 17,000 in, um, intervals means 17,000 property deeds that need to be transferred to a new owner. And the, the property deeds were the last of the documentation in the Barry land, Barry's the city of Barry where this, where the land transfer office is held. They said that, um, Carriage Hills and Carriage Ridge deeds were the last of the property deeds that were not on the Ontario digital land transfer system. So when you buy a house and you sell a house, you know, you can go in and, and it's a digital transfer of ownership, right? Picture 17,000 deeds that are in boxes in the land transfer office and somebody has to reconcile all of those because there would be say some sales but they didn't keep the land transfer, which is a government body, the land transfer paperwork wasn't kept up to date. So to try and like bundle it all up and officially hand it off to a new owner was monumental, absolutely monumental. And, and we had a handful of, of, of uh, owners, God love them all. And, and you, you are in my hearts, you really are. Um, because there were people who you know, before the pandemic hit, we'd try and we were trying to find the owners so we could alert them. So the, the land transfer records are public documents, but you can't photocopy them. So they were going in and opening boxes and taking pieces of paper and writing out like like people's names and addresses off the deeds and oh just the amount of effort was was unbelievable. So it, it was a sad day when they announced that the property decision from the survey uh, was not going to be viable. Um but because uh, there's lots of good memories, you know, the, as you said, John, at the at the opening of this, you know, timeshare is a lovely way to vacation. Yes. For some, for some people. Yes, yes, yes. And so, so the end result is, um, if I'm not mistaken, is is that the resort is sold and or right. in the so, process of being sold right now? Or so so yeah, we're, so we're in the process. So they they officially closed the doors and and uh, you know didn't take any more reservations from the owners as of the beginning of January 2020. Make sure I got that 2020. 2021. Sorry, <laughs> I lost it. Yeah. I lost a year in there for hopefully reasons that everybody knows why. Because um, yes, 2020 was when like that year was just a, a blur. But we had the um all the different court hearings and the survey and the declaration of what the owners want and then the agreement that it would be sold and then it, so january of 2021 was when they closed the doors and no more owners they hired a security company to you know yeah. drive around wow. uh, and maintain the property we paid a stupid amount of money for insurance on a property that was being temporarily wow. mothballed but they uh they put it up for sale uh in, in january it went through um a couple, we had a couple of different brokers selling you know this big huge piece of property and uh they did, they did eventually get um closed bids there was actually quite a lot of interest in the property um and uh, all of it was secret though they wouldn't tell the owners what the prices were for the different uh, bids and so on they kept it under secrecy with the courts and then uh, it came uh, the notice came out that yes they they accepted the uh, highest bid i think it was 60 million dollars or something for the two properties i think that number's right don't I was going to say, don't quote me, but this is a video. I, I've just been quoted. <laughs> um, and and uh, closing date is was the end of, of June. So um, so we're still in the process of now of the logistics of how are we going to actually, the, the court can decide uh, with a notice system that basically, you know, voids everybody's deeds with the strike of a pen and, and transfers the, the all of the individual deeds into single parcel that then gets transferred to the new owner. So my understanding, money's been paid. It's sitting in escrow somewhere uh, because now uh, we are moving into the uh, um, 
the phase of this where it will be sort of a, a reverse claims process where you as an owner will step forward. They'll put announcements through. You'll, you'll get a something in the mail that will say, hey, your property's been sold. You know, if you want your money, uh, please, you know, uh, make your claim. Um, so, so we're still not sure how that's going to flesh out, uh, but they're hoping that the money will actually come to us the beginning of 2022. Um, but I don't know how much will be left because millions and millions plural um, has been spent on consulting fees, lawyers, oh, sure. security company, all of the, all of the. Well, this this is really monumental. I I I applaud you and your group for uh, sticking with it. Um, and of course, like Irene said, in in the United States, this wouldn't be an issue. But in your country. Um, not paying your maintenance fees and bail, trying to bail out of a timeshare, uh, I guess is hung on your neck. And so uh, I'm glad you did this. I, I can't imagine how much work has gone into it. I don't know if anybody can, because as you say, 17,000 deeds. 11,000 owners, 11,000 owners, just incredible. Uh, I mean, no, we didn't, don't, don't give me, you know, don't misunderstand. We didn't reach them all. Uh, yeah. by any means but we but luckily you know and i i can't my my i tip my hat uh to lou uh lou brzezinski from from blaney mcmurtry in toronto big law firm big law firm one of the uh, seven sisters i think what they call uh the big law firms in toronto. We're, we are so grateful that he stepped up he just saw how the little guy uh could a little gal uh could could really um um you know, get get stifled here, and he attended the hearings. He gave, he spent tons of time with us. Um, really, he built us a fraction of the amount of effort that that he spent um, helping awesome. us understand our options. Because he's a bankruptcy specialist, so eventually they did declare it bankrupt, uh, and the administrator BDO as administrator was eventually uh, pivoted into uh, BDO as the receiver of of the property. Uh, and so they took over uh, as 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 receiver, which triggers a whole bunch of like bank because it was I shouldn't say it was declared bankrupt. It was managed through bankruptcy court uh, right. through a receivership program, which triggers a whole bunch of consumer protection. Uh, also, a vendor because there were some people that uh, you know the, I don't know the guys who clear the snow or cut the grass, you know, want to get paid. The employees absolutely deserve their severance pay because they were all let go. Um, and, and I hope, uh, I hope, effort, they I hope this effort. I hope that this effort, <clears throat> excuse me, encourages other groups, uh, particularly in Canada, because there are a lot of yeah. old properties in Canada. But increase the cost of vacations, but maintenance fees went from five hundred a year to fifteen hundred a year, yeah. and then have an equity stake. Well, you know it, whether you can say, oh, that's not our problem because we're not the original developer. It's still unfair because you bought this in the 80s saying that you had an equity stake it can be sold um, freeze the cost of vacations and just because it changed hands twice does it make it any less uncomfortable for the people that bought these things no, and that's true in the u.s as well well thank you karen it's so nice to see you again we yeah. really nice to see you too <laughs> and um I've enjoyed this. I've uh, learned a lot. What uh, what's coming up, Irene? Uh, for for our listeners, uh, I'm sure our listeners are just going to be so blessed with Karen. Number one, I I, I really <laughs> want to get this spread out because there's a lot of timeshare owners that are having problems with their resorts. But um, so thank you again, Karen. Uh, My pleasure. Who's, who's coming up, um, Irene? Well, I think we're going to shift the schedule a little bit because um, Wayne uh, discovered someone who wrote a, a short book on how to self-advocate out of a timeshare. And I think this follows well on the heels of Karen um, to, to see what an individual can do without having to pay anyone up front. Um, so let's let's see um, what Michael has to say next week. I, I can't remember what is his last name, um, Wayne. Do you Harmon. Know? Yes, Harmon. Sorry. Yeah. So we'll we'll uh, see if he's going to join us next Thursday, and we'll we'll see what what we can take from there. All right. Well, that's it for tonight. Thank you all very much. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you.